Today's conversation is sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. I'm not waiting for them to fall flat on their face, right? I'm waiting for them to readjust, come at the plan from a different approach and be successful. You know, and then that to me, that's a win win all the way around. Again, obviously, everybody wants their revenue stream to exceed the plan. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. And I am your host, Billy Keels, and I am super, super, super excited to share today's conversation with you because it's absolutely going to be awesome, especially if you love limited being a limited partner. This is going to be really, really awesome. And yeah, you're going to learn so much. So it's going to be amazing. So with that stated, listen, we continue to move up the charts. Really love that you continue to share the episodes that you can share continue to uh, you know leave your honest written reviews as well as ratings and if you have not done that yet if you could just take a couple seconds we even made like a really simple video for you just click the link on the apple podcast platform uh, if you listen to today's conversation then go over there and just leave an honest written review and rating would really appreciate that so and we'll continue to move up the chart so we can get more amazing guests like the one today that are going to help you move forward faster uh, also for those of you who want to see the previous episodes like way back like one three five stuff like that and you just want to binge every episode go to billykills.com once you're there go to the podcast tab and once you go to the podcast tab you can find every single episode you've ever ever wanted to see so billykills.com go to the podcast tab and it will be amazing you can find everything there. And then also for those of you who are accredited investors and you want to connect with other accredited investors, gain access to super deals and just talk about accredited investor stuff, uh, just send me an email, aiclub at billykills.com. Once again, it's aiclub at billykills.com. We can connect and it'll be awesome. So with that stated, we've got an amazing guest today who has like really, really gotten this limited partnership thing down, investing through others passively. He's going to talk about what he's done to be able to do this well over 15 times. Like there's a specific number. I won't tell you what it is, but you'll just have to listen because it's pretty amazing. Um, he's even enjoyed it so much and it's given him so much more control over his life that he is now moving into the active space. It's a guy who's has a very defined uh, way of looking at bringing value to others. He's done it for over 47 years or he did it for over 47 years in the industry and then he moved into becoming a full-time passive investor and then he, well, decided he wants to become an active investor because he wants to continue to bring value to others. You're really going to enjoy this conversation that I have with Mr. K. Trevor Thompson, which is going to be coming up just after this. So, you know what? If you want to know how success in the attractions and entertainment industry can lead to successful passive investing long distance and doing that with a passion, then guess what? Today's the conversation you're going to want to listen to until the very last word. You know why? Because today's conversation is going to be absolutely unbelievable because our guest today, listen to this, not only was a successful VP for, you're not even going to believe this. I'm going to tell you, you're not going to believe it for over 47 years or 47 years in the attractions development and operations space. He's going to tell us what that means. I think most of you know, but just in case he also spent over 20 years as a designer and builder of vertical wind tunnels. Really? Honestly, sounds amazing. He's also an accredited investor who has LP'd in over 17 deals or opportunities. It may have even changed since then. So I'm sure he's going to tell us more about that. And he loves, absolutely loves learning and sharing his knowledge. He is the founder of Niagara Investments, LLC. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. Trevor Thompson. Trevor, welcome to the hey, show. Billy, how are you doing? I'm awesome. Great to be here. <laughs> Very excited. You are better than awesome, man. <laughs> you are phenomenal. <laughs> and I know that the Going Long family is going to really enjoy and learn so much from today's conversation. So I just would love for us to jump right in. And as you know, Trevor, I ask everybody five questions. You're going to get two in the beginning. You're going to get three in the end. You're going to get questions in the middle, but I have no idea what those questions are. So I, I can't even attest to what those could possibly be. So if you're ready, we're going to go ahead and jump in with question number one. I'm ready. Which is, can you help us understand... Where is it that you live in, I'm going to say North America. Where do you live in North America? Yeah, so currently I'm in Austin, Texas, the growing crazy, crazy, crazy growing city. It's amazing what's happening. Yeah, just a little bit. But so most people would hear that and they would say, well, the accent doesn't necessarily sound like you're from Texas. No, are, you from, are, are you from Texas? 
No, sir. I'm originally from Canada. So when I say out and about, you'll know it. And uh, I moved to the U.S. about 25 years ago and was in Orlando for 11 years. And now I've been in Austin for 13 years. All right. Fantastic. Which is also why we adapt and ask where you live in North America. So it's always uh, it's always kind of um, a, a nicer thing. So with that, you're in Austin, Texas. It's a lot going on in Austin, Texas. And so help us understand, Trevor, what's the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? Positive thing in the last 24 hours. Wow. So I would say um, opportunity to be on my first deal. And we had some really good meetings yesterday and we're getting closer to close. I've been trying to get on the active side for a very long time. And uh, I feel like we're finally getting close to getting there. So I'm very excited. Fantastic. So you made progress. And then I'm sure people were like, what do you mean you want to get on the active side? And that's going to come out. Don't worry, everybody. Just relax, relax. Trevor's going to tell us all about that. Um, so congratulations. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that, that moving the momentum forward. It's always something that is positive and, and helps us to, to continue to move forward. So um, listen, Trevor, and you've probably heard me try to do this once or twice in the past and the entire going long family, like they usually forgive me because I try to tell your awesome story. I mean, I was talking about wind tunnels, 47 years, which most people will be like, that's not even possible, Billy. Like, and I tried to do that. I think it was like three and a half seconds. Yeah. Never, 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 ever going to happen. The going long family, they forgive me. Hopefully you will forgive me as well, but most importantly, you'll also help me. And yeah. it, it, could you do, uh, could you do me us a favor and share your backstory in your own words, Trevor? And one of the things I'd also like to ask you is if you could talk about some of the major decision points that you've made to this, to get to this point in your journey, and then we'll see where the conversation goes from there. Yeah. So I started in the attractions industry very early age 13. And I worked for a company called Ripley's Believe It or Not in Niagara Falls, Canada, all through high school. And then I left Ripley's Believe It or Not. And I went to Guinness World of Records. Um, they opened up a new attraction also in Niagara Falls. And my career with them grew to where I actually managed the location for them in the Empire State Building in New York City, opened up a franchise location in Los Angeles on Hollywood Boulevard. Um, it was an amazing, very interesting journey. Um, and in fact, I, I was going to open my own Guinness and originally started in Branson, Missouri, where I was actually helping a friend that owned the Guinness in Los Angeles open up a Hollywood wax museum in Branson, Missouri. And it ended up it was going to happen in Orlando, Florida. And then just as we were ready to make the deal happen, Ripley's actually bought the rights to Guinness and wouldn't grant me the franchise rights. So strangely enough, I'd already made some plans. And I ended up opening, of all things, a year-round haunted house. Um, never really been into the horror business or anything. I was a little bit gothic as a younger guy, but, uh, okay. you know, and then so I'd agreed to do that and for three years. And unfortunately, it wasn't that successful. But again, it was very, very interesting. Learned a lot. And across the street, they opened this strange thing called indoor skydiving. And really didn't pay much attention to it. To be honest, it looked like a big air conditioner for Universal Studios. It was this big, strange building. Well, long story short, I got recruited by a headhunter who brought me into the business. And at the current time, the owner had invented this new concept, started the business, and it was not that successful. And he was looking for somebody that really understood the attractions business to make it successful. And long story short, you know, we tripled the business in three years. We started growing. He took on a new partner and we ended up developing 80 locations worldwide in the next 20 years, of which I personally opened 46 of them. Um, so some very exotic locations, uh, Brisbane, Australia, uh, Queenstown, New Zealand, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Brasilia, Brazil, Calgary, Canada. So a lot of very exotic things, including on cruise lines. So we put it on the first cruise ship and uh, actually went on the inaugural cruise where we were flying the media. It was a very, very exciting career. Um, and I just loved it. And interestingly enough, at the very first team meeting some 20 something years ago, the owner gave us all a copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it touched me, but I did what unfortunately so many people did, put it back on the shelf and continued doing my life. Um, working and working and working and kind of not making any investments. And it became clear to me that that became, a, as I got older and older, um, my delays were, were really affecting me. I wasn't able to grow any passive income, do anything. 
And so then I decided, okay, that's it. I'm going to get serious. We got bought out by a private equity company. I managed to get some personal income and wealth from that. So I decided, okay, this is the trigger now that can change my trajectory. So I started understanding real estate. I joined the local mentor program and made my first few investments. And then obviously in the last four and a half years, I, I am at 17 right now and two have gone full cycle, which were my first two investments. And sadly, I made nothing. I only got my money back, uh, but I got the lessons of a lifetime out of it. And mm. so it was good. And then, as you mentioned before, now I'm switching to active because unfortunately I did get let go from my fly during COVID. And I decided that I really miss running businesses and mm. that there's a good fit for my skill set in the asset management portion of, uh, of a team that takes over projects because I love opening and running businesses. And so very excited to say I'm on my first deal now and we're hoping to close in about 30 days on a property in San Antonio. And I just can't wait to get in there and, and be able to affect the day-to-day -day operations of that apartment complex. Wow. So we start as a 13-year-old who is hanging out at Ripley's, believe it or not. I started working at 14. So you that was actually really cool. Um, and then... We take the trajectory, that thing with Rich Dad, Poor Dad definitely happened to me. I started reading it, seemed like amazing. And then it sat on the bookshelf for like three or four years. And then I picked it up again. And I was like, oh my gosh, what have I been doing the last three or four years? Um, and then all the way through passive investing, you talked about the two deals or the two opportunities where you actually went full cycle, but you didn't earn anything except you got your money back, Yeah, <laughs> which, which I think is probably not bad. <laughs> and we're, yeah. Don't worry. We're going to dive into that more as well. Um, a little bit later and then into the active part where you really are. And I saw a smile. So if you weren't watching the video, if you're not watching the video version, if you want to see Trevor, like smile ear to ear, <laughs> check out the video version when he starts talking about asset management and being able to affect change uh, that is happening. But the one thing that I actually want to kind of pick up on, you did mention that you helped a business. I think you said in was it three years to three X and go 80 locations? Yeah. So we didn't do the 80 in three years. We did the 80 over 20, but yeah. Okay. So when I originally started at the, at the first I fly, it was yeah. actually losing $50,000 a month. Gotcha. And you know, basically I was his last ditch. If you can't get this thing to work, um, you know, and then we figured it out. It became very popular with actual, the skydiving community. So they started yeah. training and we just, the thing just exploded um, and got very, very busy, um, okay. like exceptionally busy. Like our record was 172 hours nonstop operating. So if you figure that's almost a week where we ran 24-7. Yeah. Um, so if you can imagine people at four o'clock in the morning training in a wind tunnel, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, I can only imagine. But what, what so I got the time frame wrong. So it was 20 years, but, but yeah. you said out of the 80, you were personally there for the opening of over half of them, 46. Yeah, yeah 46. And it, yes. and it took you around the world, which I love. Um, it, we're definitely, because like the whole long distance thing, I'm, I've worked and traveled throughout 86 countries. And it's like you said, you mentioned New Zealand. I was thinking Queenstown. I did a bungee jump there a long time ago. Yeah. And that was amazing. And um, all that kind of stuff. I've never, not, I still haven't been to Brisbane yet, um, but I've been to Queenstown and, and Sydney. But anyway, not gonna, not, not, I'm not going to divert there. But, but one of the things that I do want to, kind of come back to is like you're in these very highly visible uh, type of roles in industries where people are feeling good about themselves, right? People typically go because they want to have a mm -hmm. great feeling and, and get an adrenaline rush. And then you went from that to this space, which is real estate, which sometimes yeah. people would say it's not necessarily like the most like coolest adrenaline rushing kind of industry. But what was it that was not happening in the entertainment slash attraction industry that made you start looking outside for something else? Well, basically I was making other people wealthy. Um, you know, so all of my work, our company was making piles and piles of money. Um, mm -hmm. And they, you know, kept uh, controlling what you're going to do and do the different things. And, you know, it was like, oh man, I'm, I'm like all of my energies the benefit of them are going to someone other than me. 
Um, you know, it's not producing anything other than a paycheck a bonus maybe once in a while, um, some sort of incentive, but you know, where when you start to get into real estate, you build your personal net worth up um, and you start to look at the world differently, look at what you're going to do differently. And it causes a shift in your thinking of, um, you know, you're sort of thinking about, I want to say just yourself, you're thinking about how can I take care of myself so I can do what I want to do later on hmm. yeah so it, and so it's basically the mind shift recognizing where you are at, that you are at, at this point for you was hey listen yeah. i'm doing all this work and i'm helping it to benefit someone else I'd, I'd like to actually start to be able to do some of the things that could help to benefit me in the in the in the life goals that that i have so so that makes a lot of sense but then you so you had the rich dad poor dad experience trevor and you decided real estate was something that you wanted to get into you've invested in 17 different opportunities as a limited partner, right? Um, Are all 17 of those opportunities in Austin, Texas? No, sir. They're all, most of them are in in Texas. Um, One in Tucson, Arizona, and another one just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And they're not all in multifamily. Multifamily is where I focus my education, but I have two land deals, a retail strip center, a medical center, a single family home fund, and an apartment to condo conversions. So I'm quite diverse in my investments. Um, And I have this sort of theory of why I'm doing it. I call it earn and learn. So I wanna be able to earn some money, but I wanna learn about a different asset class. To be Mm -hmm. honest, when I originally started, I was mostly interested in retail. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I I had some partner in the haunted house business and he ran a bunch of retail locations and it's quite interesting learning about his buying and selling and land deals. Um, But then I realized the power of multifamily Mm -hmm. and I decided, okay, that's where I'm going to focus because you can do so many more things within that space. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you can create a better place for people to live. You can create a better place for people to work. And then you can take all of your limited partners along for the ride, let them achieve financial independence, and then they can use their money for their why. Uh, It may be to continue to invest in real estate. It may be, you know, all kinds of things. And uh, I like that. I'm going to call it the circle of uh, circle of uh, wealth or whatever. Um, I, I and it's very unusual that I never anticipated I would feel this passionate about real estate. I had like no idea that I would meet so many amazing people. I would be involved in so many amazing products and businesses and things that happened, and that I would actually be changing people's lives. I had no idea. You know, I fly. It was a great experience. And I want to say it's life changing, but it's it's like a dream, right? We can fly. And, you know, so realization of people's dreams. And, you know, we had these all ability nights, my favorite night where people with severe handicaps would come and we would get them to fly. And, you know, just to see this autistic child Mm -hmm. um, who had been switched off the whole time in flight and have his eyes open up and he could realize that he was flying. I mean, nothing. I mean, you would bring tears to your eyes every time you saw it. I don't quite get tears to my eyes in multifamily yet, but, but, we're still influencing people's lives. It's amazing. Yeah. And so, you know, I, so it's interesting you say that because it, it is a matter of, it seems like you've, you have this pattern, right? Um, one of my, one of my um, mentors um, will say, you know, look for patterns and principles, right? And so it's a pattern that you've had in terms of helping others, uh, whether that's doing that through entertainment, whether that's doing that through, um, you know, being able to uh, attractions and, and doing things that are different or now even helping people from a life in a lifestyle perspective through the different assets that you are, are investing in. But I guess the one thing, knowing that they're not in Austin, Texas, the majority of them, right there, and, and it's come, it comes back to the principle uh, and the premise, excuse me, the premise of this show, which is really helping people to understand that, you know, I want people to feel comfortable and confident investing beyond their backyard. You've talked about doing this 17 times, not once, 17 times. And sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, if it's not, if the house isn't just down the street and I can't go see it every day, I'm never going to invest. Everyone, listen, we have someone who's done this 17 times passively and is now making the, the transition actively. 
This goes against everything that most of the books say to do, Trevor. You do realize that, right? It do, they, I do. Okay, I okay. Do. okay. So, so, so you're in the perfect place. You're amongst friends. You're here with family here, the going along family. But I also would love for you to share it from us because it goes against, like it's contrarian in its, in, its, in its way that you're investing beyond your backyard. So help us understand why is it that you... Or, or what, I guess, was it that you found like, okay, this is okay to invest in a place that I don't actually live because it goes against everything that the real estate books say. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, passively, it's much easier because I look for investments with people that have what I'm going to refer to as local knowledge. I don't have local knowledge in Tucson, Arizona. I don't have local knowledge in Charlotte, North Carolina. So for my first few active investments, I do plan to do them in Texas where my no local knowledge will really help. But yep. as I develop and feel more comfortable with getting a process understanding, then I'll feel more comfortable having a partner who is in the other location because I'll feel more comfortable that, okay, I can with that partner, the boots on the ground. Because boots on the ground are still a very important part of this yes. um, that you need to have. But it don't always have to be your boots. Um, and that does take can, a lot of trust can, to give your money can, to somebody else. Can you please say that again? Whose boots? Yeah, they, they, don't have, they don't have to be what? Your boots. They can be somebody else's boots. Um, yeah. Now, you need to know, like, and trust. You know, we all talk about that with that person. And, you know, they should have a track record. And you should feel comfortable. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, a, it's you're giving them, in theory, your hardworking life savings. Um, and you want to make sure that they're treating your money the same way they would treat their money. Well, they better be treating it better than they would treat their yeah. own money. In my, in my very That's humble true. opinion, first and foremost, yeah. <laughs> they better be treating it better than their own money because it's your money. You've worked for yeah. it. Um, the first thing, the, the other thing is I just, you know, it's, it's a breath of fresh air, Trevor, when you're sharing your story, because sometimes people think there's only one way to do something. Mm -hmm. And what I love about what you've just shared with us and each one of the going along family that is listening or running or cooking dinner or getting on a plane or whatever, is that you mentioned that this is the passive way. There is actively ways to do it. And then there's also, there is a process, as you say, I love that process, to everything that can be done, which is you have to know, like, and trust the person. Yeah. No, like, and trust the team. That's not something that happens overnight. This is something that is going to take you time and you should have a process to that, to be able to begin to not just know someone because that happened, that's on them, but then to begin to like, and trust the person. So, you know, you have a lot of experience in this area, Trevor. And so I know that there are a lot of very high paid professionals that are listening today and they're like, and you know what? I don't, I do want to do something else, but I just don't know how to actually, what's the, what, what should I be doing? How do I know if I'm going to like someone and trust them and da, da, da. You've got a lot of experience. Can you share just a couple of the gems with this? Once you, you, you know about someone who's, like I said, is on them, how do yeah. you begin to like, and, and more importantly, trust them? Yeah. So my first out-of-state investment was with the group that did a lot of asset management training. They wrote a book, Best in Class. And I spent a lot of time and energy in their, in their training thing. I took their paid courses. I took their free courses. I followed them around when they went to, were on webinars or when they did different people's podcasts. I listened to it. And I'll be honest, the most impressive thing to me was when they admitted when they made a mistake and how they got out of it and planned, right? I am so tired of the perfect people. There are no perfect people. There are no perfect operators that just tell you the glorious stories of the great returns. I want to know that you went into a project. I want you to be honest that you had a few struggles and then how you overcame that. That to me gets the no like and trust when I get to the trust, right? When I understand that you are going to tell me what's really happening with my investment, not what you think I want to hear. And because again, I talked about it earlier, my mission has always been to earn and learn, right? Mm -hmm. So I want, I want to earn some money. I want to give you my money and have that investment pay off, but I want to understand where are we in the project? What's, what have been our obstacles? Why is it taken so long to get to this level? And to be honest, I'm okay when it takes a little bit longer if I can learn everything about it because I'm there not only to make profit, but to get educated so that I can do a better job 
when I start asking other people to give me their money, I can be that kind of person that is open, honest, and forthright with what what am I doing and where are we in this in this investment cycle. Mm. So recognizing that there is no perfect people, the people that pretend to be perfect are probably the ones you want to run from. I love that. And hearing people, hearing about, you know, what were the obstacles that they faced, how did they overcome them and, and what ultimately what were the results? You've done this 17 times. Um, so once again, you probably have a little bit uh, of experience in this area. So be be prepared for the question here. No, um, you know, one of the things that people talk about a lot is this aspect of reporting, reporting, mm-hmm. reporting, reporting, right? And so in your estimation, what are the, what is the frequency, number one, of reporting? And what is the content of the porting, of reporting that helps you as a passive investor feel comfortable, informed, and confident that things are are being transparent or helping you to understand the current state of the, of the opportunity frequency and and content. Yeah. So, you know, obviously monthly reporting is great. Um, Few of my first investments only did quarterly reporting and and not enough. I had one investment that at the beginning actually did weekly reporting. It was a week. Did you say weekly? Weekly reporting where they said, okay, this week, this is what's happened in this week. And then they went to bi-weekly and then they went to monthly, um, which was, you know, a little, and it wasn't huge. It was just basic reports. This is where we are, what we're doing. And I was quite interested in it. I know other people that may be too much of the reporting, but what I really want to know on a report is, you know, we were here. Now we're here. This is how we got there. Here's the plan to get to where we're going. And hear how all that relates to what we told you we were going to do. Okay, so we can be ahead of, behind on. It's okay as long as we're ahead of. Hey, we think we're actually going to stay ahead of because we're getting to ride this great inflation with higher rents or whatever. Or we're behind, but we feel comfortable that now we've got a better system of removing some of the the poor tenants and putting in, you know, one of them was turning a lot of Section 8 housing to regular housing. And that takes time. Um, you know, to be able to do it properly, sometimes, you know, a little bit longer to get a CapEx project finished than they thought. And, you know, and then obviously the numbers are very important, right? You know, again, here's where we are financially, here's where we are on expenses, and here's how we are compared to where we were. I couldn't believe it. I had a year end report from a guy and I sent an email back saying, could you tell me how that is compared to plan? And his response was, look at the PPM. We haven't buried that plan. And I thought, what a terrible answer for the no like and trust. Like, go look it up yourself, right? So, like, so is this someone that you would invest with again in the future? No, it's not. Okay. No. You know, so, I want somebody to say, okay, you know, and I want that to come out as a normal part of the planning, right? Here yeah. was the plan that we promised you we would take. And here's where we are relative to the agreed upon plan. And I understand sometimes you're exceeding it and sometimes you're not exceeding it, you know, and everybody always hopes to exceed it, of course, right? We did conservative underwriting, everyone says, and what does that really mean? Um, you know, but uh, how, do, you know, how do we get to that plan? Um, if everybody does conservative underwriting, then in theory, all my investments should be above the plan. Um, and they're not, I'm going to be honest, uh, uh, but some are, some are doing better because we're in this strange phenomenon right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's it's really interesting that you mentioned that because sometimes there, there, there so there's the content of the actual reporting. So, it, and like you said, it helps you to understand: are you ahead of plan? Are you behind plan? Are you on plan? And and why are those things happening? As a passive investor, do you care more about the explanation of where you are, or as you mentioned before, that the that the funds reach your account on the days that they reach your account, or maybe said a different way. Are you more willing to be understanding if you get exactly what you were supposed to get financially on the day that you were supposed to get it? And the reporting is eh, versus the reporting, which is absolutely phenomenal, tells you where you are, why you are, you're way behind plan and your payment comes 50%, 60% below plan and, um, and late. Well, 
you know, obviously the best is a good report with the meeting plan, but that doesn't always happen. <laughs> that, that, that wasn't one of the, <laughs> that I wasn't one of the options. Happen, but, uh, you You've know, done this 17 times. That's why you get the hard questions. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, you know, I want to know where we are and I want to know honestly where we are and why we're not there. I'm a big boy and I understand that, uh, the real estate investing, while it should be safe and secure, still mm -hmm. is. You know, there's 180 something pages in a PPM that tells you why you're an idiot to give me your money, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is a reason for that. This is a this is an investment. It's a risky business, but I want to at least get the honest truth of where we are mm -hmm. again, because it goes back to this earn and learn. How did we get here? Why are we struggling? And what is the plan to get there? And nothing makes me happier when they overcome and get there, right? You know, I'm not waiting for them to fall flat on their face, right? I'm waiting for them to readjust, come at the plan from a different approach and be successful, you know? And then that, to me, that's a win-win all the way around, right? It's a win for the residents, it's a win for the property management company, it's a win for the syndicators, it's a win for the investors. Um, you know, so again, obviously everybody wants their revenue stream to exceed the plan. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everybody dreams of that, right? The big, uh, you know, double multiple of my money in three years, you know, who doesn't go to bed and dream about that, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it's once again, it's it's from a going long family, how, what is, what are some of the the points that, that Trevor's talking about that are really important that I want you to think about? Because he's really leaving you lots of golden nuggets. I would even say some of them are platinum. Number one is every investment, real estate included, has its inherent risks. It is about understanding what are those risks up front. And you just said it, you're a big boy. Um, and so it's about being able to stay uh, informed about what is happening. And that can take on a number of different ways, right? Depending on how many investors you have, maybe it's a phone call, but it's talking about where we are compared to plan. And um, whether it's phone call, it's emails, it's quarterly, it's weekly, it's daily, it's it's monthly, whatever it is, that it's a, it's a way that's being able to be done in a consistent manner to keep your investors informed. Because typically when the payments are made on time, every time, there's less of a challenge, but when they're not, and there's not been any information, that's usually when yeah. the, the, bad, the bad things start to happen. So um, Tr Trevor, was there anything you wanted to add on that? No, I just think okay. that that for every syndicator out there, you know, share more than less and mm -hmm. let the reader skim through it or dig deep into it and ask some questions. You know, some yeah. people are quite happy with a high level report. They'll mm -hmm. read through it quickly. And other people like me are obsessive learners and want to understand, you know, every single thing like yeah. um and, and I'll absorb all of the bits of information. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got a learn and uh, learn and earn strategy and that's, and, and that's it. One of the things I would recommend, and I don't do very many recommendations to anyone who is considering getting into syndication when you're the, the investor who has entrusted you with their hard earned money, when they ask a question, I wouldn't recommend that you say, go read the PPM. <laughs> not something that I would highly recommend. Um, I I, Tre Trevor, exactly. would you agree with that? <laughs> I couldn't believe it, you know? Um, and I just said, you know, I just want to get an idea how we're doing compared to, and you would think he would already know, and he would have some sort of document that would say, here's how I'm performing the plan. So, no. and to be honest, I haven't had the time to go back and do it. I'm assuming no. it's not good news since he didn't do it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I actually, that reminds me, I need to go do it today because uh, <laughs> I really want to know. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll let you do that. Speaking of which, one of the things that is important, and I do want the, the kind of wrap things up before we get into the going along final three, I, I do want to talk about your movement to, from passive to, to active, but it, there's so much that we can also learn from you, Trevor, in terms of from a passive investing uh, perspective. When you're a passive investor and you understand the... The, the syndicator and kind of who they are. And sometimes there's a syndicator and then there's an operator, right? Sometimes it's the same person uh, or the same entity, if you will. But help us understand what are some of the things that you have found to be the most effective or what I would call from my old corporate speak was best practice from having a robust due diligence uh, process as you look to invest your hard earned capital. Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to make sure that they they've really done their due diligence. You know, um, it's 
It's amazing. Like I've been on several due diligence part of what I was doing. There was a couple of deals I was on and I got a copy of the due diligence report and this deal ended up falling through, but I'm like, hold on a minute. They missed all of these things. And all of these things have some substantial cost to them. You know, like I counted 15 broken windows. Where's new windows in the plan, right? There's, there was nothing, not even just a line item saying, you know, there was sidewalk upheaval. That was a safety factor. You know, um, and I was and I so went back to the main sponsor and said, you know, where are all these things in this due diligence report? Like, mm-hmm. you know, it was significant. So, so how do you, so Trevor, so then, and I'm, I'm putting myself in the extreme location, right? Cause I'm a, I'm someone who lives in Barcelona, Spain, and I'm yeah. looking at it in, and I have a, a sponsor and the deal is in name your city in the Midwest, right? Yeah. And you're talking about something that's very micro. So how yeah. do, how would, what are some of the things that I could do as a passive investor? You know, I've got three, $500,000 I want to put into deals or a deal. And you're talking about something that's windows. Like how can I, what, what are some of the things that you I mean, you're invested honest, in? It's hard, it's hard to do. You've just got to trust that you've been giving your money to a quality operator. Um, you know, it, it's, you just really have to, to, under, you know, do that. Right. Hmm. Um, and that they've got really strong person there that, that, you know, sees and, and knows what's going on. It's, yeah. and it, it is the big hard thing, you know, cause it's a big trust that, that they, they're giving you all the information. <laughs> Yeah. And so, and, and yeah, and that's definitely one of the things like, would, would you say that's unreasonable for someone who's going to, you know, put three, $400,000 in a, a, or even 50 grand. Right. And they're saying, Hey, listen, I'd love to get pictures of what the property looks like, or do you have any drone footage or things like, cause, cause I love what you're talking about. Like if, if you just see the property, sometimes it just helps you say, Hey, yeah. listen, I've seen this property is it, or, you know, give me a property with a date stamp. And, you know, I'd love to be able to see what it looks like now and you know from there what's the plan because sometimes you can actually see that there are broken windows or that the parking lot looks like it needs to be completely repaved and then as you're looking at that then you can see and as part of their plan if that is actually contemplated as part of the uh, the refurbishments would would it seem unreasonable to ask for that kind of stuff from a syndicator or it's it is for them to maybe send it to you is my, they might not want to do that, but I had someone who asked about that. So I actually did a zoom call with them in a screen share and showed them the 380 page due diligence report to the point where they were so bored. <laughs> like, but, but, but it goes, it's it, not exciting. <laughs> but no, Trevor, but I, I love, so this is a perfect example, right? You just said you'd rather give more information than not enough. And so, Hey, listen, I've got this 380 page document that I'm re- really willing to take you through. Um, I, you know, somebody is there and they did a video walking through the property. We could send that to you. Do, you know, do you want to spend the next 18 hours going through this 380 page report? Perfect. Let's go. Let's jump on the zoom. Yeah. I mean, it's just, um, it, it, it is one of those things, but in, in, in I guess the, the, also the reason for the question is you can at least ask whether yeah. or not the syndicator is going to be willing to do that or able to do that. Then it also goes back to, well, you know, the person yeah, is starting to like the person, but does that response provoke trust? Yes yeah. or no. And you know, there are a number of different ways that you could, you know, that you, that you could take that, but I, I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that with us. So, but I kind of want to, there's this one thing that is really, really cool <laughs> that I want to talk to you about because after you've done the limited partnership 17 times, I know I keep going back to that number. You really are moving towards a more active role. Yes. You talked to us a little bit about the fact that you like to be able to make impact. You're really looking forward to this that's coming up, but what was, what's been some of the driver for you to want to move from the very, you know, I would say fruitful learning and earning a lot in 17 different uh, opportunities. And I know two of them have gone full cycle and maybe wasn't exactly what you'd planned or whatever, but why move from that to, to the active role? You know, cause it, the, it excites me. The whole thing excites me and I'm not ready just to sit back and collect passive income. You know, I always say in theory, I have no life, but doing this. And uh, so I just, I want to see, I see myself as being able to do the, this, this, and being able to be someone that someone could give their money to, I could give them a good return. I, I, I just love managing businesses. I love operating things. I love incremental improvement. And I'm not going to get that on the passive side. Um, I'm not going to feel that, you know, I'm not old enough to completely just say, okay, I'm going to go sit on a beach. I would go crazy. I would be unhappy. 
And so even though it's hard work getting deals, running deals, managing deals, it's, don't get anybody wrong. Being an active syndicator is hard, real work. Hmm. I'm ready for that because I get a good portion of my reward out of that. Um, you know, the kind of who I am and who I am that I was able to make it a better place to live, make it a better place to work, make it a good investment. And then, you know, everybody gets to go do their why after those things have happened and, and their why can be whatever it is. Um, you know, I know some people that just, you know, want to do completely different things with it. They have no, they're not doing it for any other purpose than to fulfill their why. You know, they've got a mission or a charity or a cause. Um, and then some are just so that they can stop their nine to five. And, uh, you know, they, they want to do that and, you know, go to, go to live in Europe like you did and just, you know, say, I'm going to have a whole new lifestyle change. And uh, yeah. for me to be able to, through my activities, give people that, I find that very rewarding. And, and so being able to have this personal reward also has a lot to do with having clarity in terms of what it is that you want to be able to achieve in life, yeah. right? I mean, it, and it goes back to the same things we were talking about just a second ago, the principles yeah. that you had. You recognized at a certain point you were working for someone else and you, well, although that was treating you well and you'd had a lot of success, you were looking to do something where you had more control. And so, yes. and this passive investing thing came along and you were doing that and it was passive and it was more control than what you were doing before and you would see the direct benefits. But then even at that point, you recognize, hey, listen, this is kind of cool. I've done it. I've gained the experience. I've earned, I've learned. And now, you know what? I want to now take it to something else. And so there's this constant reevaluation of where you are in your life and being able to create opportunities that allow you to, to, to be fulfilled. Yes. Um, would, would that seem, does that seem it's reasonable? Exactly it. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and being able to create those opportunities, which I think is is great. And you're seeing that uh, this, the people that you're surrounding yourself with and the networking opportunities and, and also, most importantly, Trevor, is really continuing to take action, which I think is yeah. is absolutely awesome. So listen, man, I want to keep talking, but I, I, you know, we, we kind of have to get to the going long final three. And the thing is, I never, as you know, I never ask anybody the going long final three. And because today you are our super special guest, Trevor, um, I'll never ask the question unless you tell me that you're ready for me to ask you. So are you ready? I'm ready. Why did I know you were going to say that? I knew you were going to say that. So here we go. So for, so from our friend from Canada, who's now calling the Lone Star State home over on that side of the pond, I'd like to ask, well, this guy from Ohio, who's now living over here in Europe to ask you on this side, bring the whole, everybody back this way and have you tell us what is your favorite European city that you've either visited, Trevor, or is still on your bucket list to visit? Yeah, my bucket list is Barcelona. Um, oh, yes. It is. It, it just, everything I hear about it, see about it, um, you know, it, it looks amazing. It really does. Um, you know, and, and, and everything, yeah, just, it, it's not, it's been on my bucket list. I've not been there, um, but, you know, definitely, definitely there. So, so you haven't been here yet and now you have a friend that's here. So definitely make sure that right. we're talking about what the plan is going to be when you get here and it'll be all that kind of cool stuff. So uh, I, I'm ready for that conversation. So yeah. let me know when you're ready. Um, perfect. So appreciate that. And then question number two, and this is really one of the things that I have learned from, well, being very fortunate, to be honest, and having met a lot of very successful people. And I consider you to be someone who's very successful as well. Um, and, and one of the things that happens when I recognize with successful people is that successful people, unlike most people, like one of the main reasons that they're successful, Trevor, is because, well, they typically, on the very first time they do something, they typically get it right and they continue to accept. <sighs> I get super nervous every time I ask this question. So it's, um, well, it's, it's just kind of, well, it's kind of an inside joke. Don't worry. It's an inside joke with me and the going long family. I didn't really mean what I said, sort of. It has to do with successful people. It has to do a lot with the things that I've learned from successful people. And hopefully you'll agree. And this is no joke. People that are successful tend to do and make a lot of mistakes, a lot more mistakes than most people, like literally like 20, 30 times more mistakes than most people, but they do do one thing very, very differently. And every single time that successful people make relevant mistakes, without a doubt, every single time they stop, they learn from the mistake, and then they put different strategies, tactics, or actions in place that minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening again. Yeah. 
So you as someone who is a very successful person, and I'm sure you've had learning, mis- learning opportunities or mistakes or however you want to call them. Don't think about those specifically, but think about what is the learning um, opportunity that you had from that? Or what is the, what is the one thing that you would pay forward to the going long family to help us minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening? moving forward. Yeah. You know, the most important thing is to realize when you've done it, right. To, Mm -hmm. to just say, listen, wow, man, did I miss that? And then make a plan that, that, that is now, it's not a failure. It's a learning opportunity and to completely switch your mind shift around. And instead of getting defeated by it, to use it, to get motivated, to get to the next level, to figure out how I could not do this again. Um, You know, like you said, all successful people fail all the time. You know, I always used to say that if you don't make any mistakes, you're really not doing anything. Right. You're just oh, yeah. living so close to the sheltered side. You're not even doing anything. Go out there and make some mistakes and you're going to learn. Now, part of the reason why I wanted to be a passive investor first and learn a lot, I did not want to learn my mistakes with somebody else's money. Mm-hmm. And so I did not start switching to active till I felt more comfortable that my mistakes weren't going to cost other people money. doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. doesn't mean I'm going to be fantastic and always deliver everything. It just, hopefully I'll make less, less of them and I'll have that awareness to recover quickly. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely love it. So realize when you've done it and, um, and yeah, so I think it makes absolute sense. Absolute sense. So here's, we go to the, uh, to the third of the going long final three, Trevor, and this is really about feeding our brains with knowledge. So what's the one book you would recommend to the Going Along family today? Yeah, so you got to read Grant Cardone's 10X. Um, do the Audible. Um, it's incredible. And then you have to follow it up with Be Obsessed to Be Average. So I'm taking two mm-hmm. books by Grant Cardone. But I listen to him at least two to three times a year. Okay. Um, and it is shocking. Um, there's tons of other good books out there. But those ones have, I'm going to refer to them as changed my life, my thought process. Awesome. So 10X, which means then you had to over deliver, which makes sense. And then you have the second book, which is uh, Be Obsessed, be obsessed or, be average. or Be Average. There you go. And do All the right. Audible. He does a great job narrating. Do, yeah, do the Audible. I got the 10X Audible. So I also have the book. I have this weird thing where I buy the book and the Audible, but it's a whole different <laughs> thing. We'll, t- we'll talk about that later. Um, so listen, Trevor, so I honestly, like these conversations, like they fly by, like they just go by super fast and they bring me all the way back to you today's conversation at 13 <laughs> getting started ripley's believe it or not going from there into guinness and then from there you're you know you're you're going on and you're deciding well hang on a second i want to you even talked about branson missouri and i used to live in the state of missouri which was absolutely uh, unbelievable continuing to help people um, through entertaining and and helping them feel sensations that they'd never done. And you talked about wind tunnels and being able to open 46 different locations around the globe, which is amazing. Lots of different experiences. And all the, all the while, you really wanted more control. Yeah. And so then you found this thing called real estate and this ability to invest passively. And that started to give you more control. And you not only did it once or twice or 10 times or 15 times, well, you're an overachiever, kind of 10X as you talked about already, right? So 17 times the experience, being able to taste it, being able to get the experience, being able to also recognize as you begin to also now transition even to more of the active role, what are the different lessons that you learned as you earned before? And so I know that there are so many people are like 17 times, oh my gosh, he's doing this. You're moving from this place to that place. You had 47 years of experience in this industry and now you continue to keep moving forward forward. Like, I know that there are a lot of people that go along family, Trevor, that want to contact you, reach out to you, find out more about what you have going on also too at the Niagara Investment uh, Investments LLC. So help us understand what's the best way for the going along family to reach out and contact you and find out more about you and what you've got going on at Niagara Investments LLC. Yeah. So I'm very active on LinkedIn. So K Trevor Thompson or on Facebook. Um, Also, you can email me at KTT, which is my initials, at Niagara-Investments.com. And by the way, the Niagara is because I'm from Niagara Falls. Um, And then my website is Niagara-Investments.com. But uh, reach out to me. I love meeting new people and uh, sharing my passion with them. All right. Fantastic. So email is KTT at Niagara hyphen investments.com. It's investments, right? Yes. Or, okay. Investments.com. We're also going to make it really easy for everybody. You all know that. We're going to put it in the show notes. All you have to do is click and you can go write them an email right away. Facebook, we can't do much about. 
LinkedIn, everybody, you always know this. This is part of the going long family thing. When you reach out to Trevor, make sure that you send him something that is personalized so that he knows that you uh, have already invested some time to listen to the two of us or watch the two of us here on the going long podcast with Billy Keels so that it will help the two of you continue the conversation in a much easier fashion. It gives you some context. So make sure that you link with him and do it in a personalized way. So um, with that, listen, Trevor, been an amazing conversation. Really, really, really from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for investing your time with me and the entire Going Long family, man. Thank you so much. That's absolutely my pleasure. All right. Fantastic. If you give me like 15 seconds, I just want to say the last words to the Going Long family. Didn't you love today's conversation? Trevor was awesome. Give you really actionable insight and ability to, to go out and take this conversation, start putting things into place in your actions, start taking action today, uh, share today's conversation with someone else. Cause you know, other friends of yours really needed to hear this story today to help them start to take action to move forward. And you know what, as you're doing that, I'm really, really looking forward to welcome you back on the very next conversation. So until then go out and make it a great day and thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>